This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Uh, well, then, Colonel Koch, uh, if you could talk to us about your decision to uh, to tell your superiors that you did not feel you could prosecute this case because of the issues of, of uh, possible torture. Well, um, Juan, it, it, it was, again, it was sort of an incremental thing. I was receiving this information from my criminal investigator that, that he was gleaning through these unofficial, unofficial sources. Um, and after studying the U.N. Torture Convention, I found that there was a provision uh, under Article 15 of the U.N. Torture Convention that said any evidence derived uh, as a result of torture was inadmissible in any proceeding. And so, uh, you know, I, I was trying to figure out, okay, what is any proceeding? And as I could tell from the, uh, the source material behind the U.N. Torture Convention, I came to the legal conclusion that that included a uh, military commission uh, as we were conducting them at that time under the President's military order of November of 2001. Um, I then turned to um, the ethical uh, concern about what information did I need to be able to turn over to a defense counsel for Slahi in the future. Um, and I would note at that time Slahi did not have a defense counsel because we had not uh, gone through the, the formal process of, of, uh, of bringing a charge against him. So I, I reviewed the, the uh, pertinent ethical obligations. It, under the discovery uh, provisions of the President's military order at that time, it was um, evidence uh, of, uh, of his guilt known to the prosecution. Uh, and another provision was that the, uh, the detainees would have a full and fair trial. And so it was a very broad, uh, broad construct, if you will, for discovery. As I looked at the ethical obligations that uh, we have in the United States under the uh, ABA model rules and specifically under the rules of professional conduct of my, my bar, the state of North Carolina, I concluded that if I was in possession of information that if given to his defense counsel, would allow his defense counsel to um, utilize those protections under Article 15 of the U.N. Torture Convention, I had that obligation to turn over to that defense counsel what I knew. Um, and, and that was, again, prospective. Yeah. I was wrestling with, these, with this legal issue and with this ethical issue. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, you know, one Sunday when I was in church, uh, it all kind of came together. Um, I described myself as an evangelical Christian. Uh, I was attending a, a church service uh, in the Anglican tradition, and it, it was a baptism of a child. And anybody who's ever been to one of these services knows that at the end of the, of the baptism, all of the, the congregants of, in, in the church stand up, and the pastor goes back and forth with um, the, basically the tenets of, of the Christian faith. And one of those tenets was that we would... Uh, respect the dignity of every human being. And it was at that time when I was professing that on Sunday, begged the question to me, um, if this is what you believe as a Christian, then how does that inform how you're going to act uh, the other six days of the week? And, and that really, for me, was the, the moral point that I came to of what I had to do next. And what I did next was I uh, went and, and met with the chief prosecutor uh, for the Office of Military Commissions. I told him my, my legal opinion. I told him my ethical uh, opinion. And then I stated, and, you know, I have a moral uh, reservation at this point that what's been done to, to Slahi is just reprehensible. And uh, for that reason alone, I, I'm going to refuse to participate in the prosecution of his case. Um, shortly, within a, a couple of days, I reduced that those positions into writing. I provided them to the chief prosecutor. Um, and then after a few days, I was told uh, to transfer that case to someone else and for me to get busy on my other cases. 
Well, in that uh, in that memorandum, you not only raised uh, the question, you said that, quote, if these techniques are deemed to be torture under the Geneva Convention, then they would also constitute criminal violations of the War Crimes Act. Uh, and you went on to say, as a practical matter, I am morally opposed to the interrogation techniques employed with this detainee and for that reason alone refuse to participate in this prosecution in any manner. Now, that must have been uh, a— uh, a bomb for you to put that into a uh, uh, memorandum to your supervisors in resigning from the case. What was the reaction? Um, well, he, he wasn't happy about it. Um, and, and his name was? You know, in our—that in our, uh, was uh, Colonel Bob Swan. He was not happy about it. Um, I felt like putting it into a memorandum was what I had to do to allow him to make an informed decision about uh, the reservations that I had. My hope was uh, th that memorandum would be shared with uh, higher authorities over uh, in the Department of Defense. You know, e even if he didn't agree with my legal reasoning or my, my uh, ethics opinion or my moral reservations for that matter, at least to present to someone, hey, this is a potential issue that could be raised, uh, and we need to be able to address that. Um, and to my knowledge, that memorandum was never shared outside of the office. So the defense never saw it either? It's well, not. at this point, uh, Slahi has never been charged at a military commission. He does have of counsel uh, who represents him for a, um, a habeas corpus petition that he has, he has brought in, uh, in federal court. Um, but where that memorandum went uh, after that point, I don't know. Um, we're talking um, uh, to Lieutenant Colonel Couch, um, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Couch, retired U.S. Marine Corps prosecutor, served in the Office of Military Commissions from 2003 2006, now is an immigration judge, speaking to us from Charlotte, North Carolina. And we're joined by Jess Braven, who um, focuses on um, this case and others in his new book. The Terror Courts, Rough Justice at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, Jess Braven writes for The Wall Street Journal. Um, talk about the defense of what's been taking place at Guantanamo and um, what these terror courts are, why you chose not only to write articles about this, but write a book. Well, I chose to write a book because uh, it was, you know, to me, perhaps the biggest legal story in decades that I had a chance to follow as it unfolded. Uh, the, the journal sent me down to Washington in October from New York from, in October 2001 to cover the legal aftermath of 9-11. And as all kinds of things were happening, including the, the bill that became uh, known as the, the Patriot Act, uh, were moving through Congress, I got wind of, of work in the Bush administration to authorize military tribunals, what they call military commissions, to prosecute uh, the people behind 9-11. That was the, uh, the plan, and I thought that was uh, uh, an astounding development because this type of justice uh, is a sort of ad hoc t sort of trial that has uh, occasionally been uh, held by the United States uh, during or after wartime. Uh, these hadn't been held since World War II. And so it was, uh, it was a, a dormant area of law that suddenly might be very much alive. And so I followed that. The President Bush issued his order in November of 2001, uh, and it was a remarkable document because it laid out a concept of trial that was, uh, it, it, would, it would be unrecognizable in, in modern courtrooms. It was drafted from uh, a document that FDR had signed in 1942, shortly after Pearl Harbor, that had authorized a single specific trial of eight uh, Nazi saboteurs. And that was a secret trial that was held in the Department of Justice building. Uh, the Supreme Court very quickly, in a secret proceeding, approved it, and six of those eight were uh, electrocuted uh, within days. Uh, two later had their sentences commuted. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a, a remarkable historical incident in the 1940s, this document that uh, President Bush signed envisioned a similar type of proceeding, uh, not as one trial for a handful of people who had been picked up during a, a sabotage operation in, inside the United States, but as a permanent new form of justice going forward, one that would be wholly walled off from the existing federal courts, wholly walled off from any kind of congressional oversight. So that was the legal origin, and it took, and that was at a place before the United States had captured anybody. 
before Guantanamo had been selected as a place to hold them. So it was a legal story. And what I have done over the past year since then is covered the way that uh, project has unfolded. And what's going on now, in some ways, is very different from what could have taken place under that initial order. On the other hand, in some ways, uh, it is uh, tied to that because the people who are subject to those trials are people like uh, Mr. Slahi. Now, he, is, he has not been charged since uh, Colonel Couch filed that memo. No one else, apparently, has been willing to take up the case He hasn't case been charged. Either. How long has he been held? Uh, he has been held a decade. But, you know, the interesting thing in your account, it's a fascinating account, not only because you go into the history of military commissions from the time of George Washington uh, uh, to, uh, to now, but you also uh, detail uh, the behind-the-scenes battles that occurred within the Bush administration, the, uh, the executive order that Bush signed. Apparently, he didn't even bother to read it very carefully. Uh, as, as you explained, he was on his way to, a, uh, to his ranch in Texas. At the, at the time, and but that the really the battles that occurred between uh, David Addington, uh, John Yu, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft, uh, there was there was a real tug of war within the administration over these military commissions. Well, that's right, because the commissions project uh, it was not something that arose because the Justice Department or the Defense Department or the CIA said. Gosh, we don't know how we're going to deal with uh, the, you know, this terrorist organization. We have our, we ha our justice system is incapable of handling it. We, d we just don't know what we need, how to handle it. We need to create something brand new to solve this problem. And then they studied different options and came up with this. It wasn't, it didn't arise that way. It was a top-down idea. There were a number of people in the administration who had been thinking about this for many years. In fact, since the 1980s, following the uh, Pan Am 103 uh, bombing, the, the the airliner that blew up over Scotland, this idea had been circulating in some conservative legal uh, uh, circles to resurrect this form of justice. So it was a top-down kind of idea, and other people in the administration weren't big fans of it. And one, of course, as you point out, was Attorney General Ashcroft. It, it, some people found that surprising when they learned that in the book, because right after 9-11, people uh, you know, who, were, who, who were there at the time uh, might remember he was the face of the administration's response, and he was highly criticized by civil libertarians for the, what they said was a very harsh reaction to 9-11. But behind the scenes, uh, he was trying to preserve the Justice Department's uh, authority to handle criminal prosecutions. Now, his critics, people in, in some of the Defense Department and some others, uh, said, well, it's just a turf battle over which department's going to have this very important uh, mission. Uh, but he was against this. He didn't see a reason to have it because his own staff was opposed to the idea of setting up some alternative to regular prosecutions. And you noted the book that that uh, unlike uh, uh, other types of major decisions like this, this wasn't circulated among key officials in the administration. So that Condoleezza Rice, national security advisor, and uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell had no idea of the decision until they, until it was uh, later announced. That's right. Well, they learned about it from CNN, and even more even more. Uh, important for the way this issue uh, played out was that the CIA was not informed about it. And what has characterized this project uh, for its entire history has been conflict between the CIA and uh, the Department of Defense over the access to evidence. And this, again, given what happened later with the CIA and their secret prison network and so on, uh, might, might be surprising. But it turns out, uh, at least from my reporting and talking to the CIA officials, is that they were quite comfortable with the existing pre-9-11 setup. Here in New York, in the Southern District of New York, they're very experienced prosecutors and judges who deal with very sensitive cases, and the CIA had worked with them for years, and was comfortable that they could handle very important classified national security evidence and still get their trials underway. The CIA had no involvement in setting up military commissions, did not know the military officers involved in them, did not have a high regard for a bunch of unknown mid-level people, reservists and so forth, and was very uncooperative with military commissions all the way. Uh, Colonel Couch and other prosecutors frequently trying to get information from the CIA, not uh, because they wanted to know what evidence there was, and also because they felt they had a duty to present the defense with anything that could be exculpatory, ran into roadblock after roadblock. Uh, and to this day, the CIA continues to have a somewhat conflicting relationship with military commissions as recently as a few weeks ago, when apparently a CIA censor, unknown to the military judge, uh, briefly blocked the audio transmission from the Guantanamo courtroom. Explain.
Well, there is right now. I mean, and again, there are military commissions now. They are a modified version of what originally was envisioned. There are a number of changes that make them uh, significantly less unfair than what could have uh, occurred. Uh, but uh, there is a, uh, in the high security courtroom down there, the proceedings take place behind soundproof glass. And if you are in the press and you're there watching, or if you're watching the, uh, the video feed uh, here on the mainland at Fort Meade, uh, Maryland, uh, there is a 40 second delay. So what you're seeing is actually taking place 40 seconds in the future from what you're hearing. And that is so uh, government censors can cut the feed if what they deem to be secret information is released in the courtroom by a witness or a prisoner or a lawyer or what have you. So that button has been pushed several times. Up until now, it always been pushed by the courtroom security officer. Uh, most recently, it was pushed by someone who the judge didn't even know was listening, and we assume that it was the CIA because it has classification authority, as they say in government speak, over this information. Now, to be fair, in every instance, the military judge has concluded that the censor was in error, and what was said during that period was put back on the record. So uh, there hasn't actually been anything said in that courtroom that has been kept down, but that potential is there. The trajectory from President Bush to President Obama, what President Obama did? Well, President uh, Bush's initial order, which envisioned this sort of legal time machine going back to, to 1942, uh, the Supreme Court threw out that uh, project in 2006 in a, a very long, almost 80-page opinion by, by Justice John Paul Stevens uh, said that the, the Bush administration had misread the, the legal precedents and that the president lacked authority to set up this system. So a number of things happened after that, but the end result was a bill that Congress passed in 2006 called the Military Commissions Act. Act, which authorized a version of military commissions, which uh, didn't look anything like U.S. district courts, but was also considerably more uh, fair than what President Bush initially uh, had in mind. And one reason was that the Bush order said, no one who's convicted here has any appeal to the federal courts. I will have the last word. Uh, the, 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 the statute says, actually, the, the, the federal courts do get final oversight of military commissions. President Obama did not support that. He thought it was not fair enough. And he made a lot of statements during the campaign for president in 2008, uh, uh, suggesting tremendous skepticism for military commissions and saying that both civilian courts and the existing military justice system, the one that Colonel Couch was trained in and, and other military lawyers, that uh, courts martial that prosecute uh, service members, that either of those systems uh, would be a, a better way to go. Once he took office, he uh, got a lot of advice, conflicting advice over this, and he chose uh, to take a sort of middle path. He asked, what changes in military commissions do you need to do to make them fair enough? And uh, a number were proposed involving the how hearsay can be admitted, a few other things. Uh, and he uh, sent those to Congress in 2009. Uh, those changes were uh, adopted, and military commissions were reauthorized. So now we're basically on Commissions 3.0, uh, which uh, looks uh, something in between what, what uh, President Bush had in mind, uh, but not a district court. We have to break, but we're going to come back to this discussion. Um, Jess Braven is the author of The Terror Courts, Rough Justice at Guantanamo Bay. The book has just been published. And we're also joined by Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Couch, uh, who's speaking to us from Charlotte, um, now an immigration judge, was at Guantanamo. And we're going to talk about some other cases at Guantanamo. Stay with us. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.